really pleased to be here with you all. We have uh, a great agenda lined up, have a couple of our leaders from um, our DevOps practice with Deloitte Consulting, as well as one of the authors. I'd like to just quickly introduce myself. My name's Josh Moore. Um, I'm a manager in our Deloitte Consulting practice, specifically focused on cloud engineering, agile, and DevOps transformation. And I also have the privilege of, of helping do a lot of our agile and DevOps eminence like these webinars. I'll pass it over to Derek to, to uh, do an introduction. I'm Derek. I'm a quantitative user experience researcher at Google. And I think that amounts to usually I don't know, finding patterns in the data that suggests where we can, you know, we have opportunities to provide more for our customers. This year, I got to use some of that background to analyze the data behind the, the report that we're going to be talking about this year and get to, get to write about it a little bit. I'll, I'll pass it over to Manoj. Hi, all. My name is Manoj Mishra. I'm a managing director in Deloitte, uh, uh, being, uh, bring over 20 plus years experience advising in the areas of software delivery, innovation, and I have been really passionate about driving excellence in software. And it has been a passion for the last 20 plus years where I have worked towards increasing the efficiency of software development. And that's why my interest in this area, but also more importantly, tying it to the business outcomes that we can deliver. I did want to say a few words about this particular report. And there's one reason that we all, that Deloitte sponsors this report, and that's basically our common interest with Google and the DevOps research organization to find out the patterns in software, find out the anti-patterns, and figure out how we can improve the efficiencies around technology and software development. So we have been part of this report. I think the report has been for eight years plus, and we have been part of that journey for most of it. So very, very proud to be part of this report. I will pass it on to Eddie for his introduction. Eddie Krumholz, I'm a technology fellow out of the Denver office, uh, and I am part of the leadership team within Modern Delivery, uh, which incorporates all the areas of agile, DevOps, site reliability, engineering, observability. Super happy to be here. Like Manoj said, every year, this report it gets better and better because we see the industry trends and how organizations are really adopting these uh, practices. So it's really interesting to see, you know, just the changes in the technology, the changes in the cultures, the changes on how process and, uh, is, is implemented. So looking forward to this discussion. We'll start off today's panel by hearing from Derek. He's going to be walking through the key themes, the executive summary of this year's State of DevOps report. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to a discussion. So the majority of today is going to be a, a panel uh, between Derek, Manoj, and Eddie talking through uh, some of the key themes of this year's report. Uh, we'll also be having a 10-minute Q&A at the end of today's session. So please uh, use the Q&A feature to submit all questions. And please do that throughout the, uh, the one hour that we have together. I'll be reading through those um, and we'll try to answer those questions in the order received during the last 10 minutes. You may have heard the, the notification when you joined, but today's webinar is also being recorded. And then finally, you know, please reach out to us. We'll be sharing our personal emails at the end of the webinar. But if you want to get in contact with the larger um, eminence team that's, that's uh, responsible for this webinar, as well as a lot of our Agile and DevOps content uh, for Deloitte Consulting, uh, the the email address is at the bottom, US, US, that is two US's, uh, modern delivery eminence at Deloitte.com. And with that, I'll turn it over to Derek to talk about uh, this year's key themes. I think the first theme that's worth talking about is how we did it. We did a deep dive this year into security. If we had to sort of, we, we initially planned on sort of making the whole report center around security, but then we realized there's still a lot of other fun stuff. So... It was only a small proportion of it, but given the increase that we've seen in recent years for malicious attacks, it felt really relevant to try to understand what security practices teams were implementing and to, to what extent, what was enabling these security practices and what these security practices enable. What are the impacts of uh, implementing these security practices. But I think it's safe to say in the sort of the, the top line here that 
the prevalence of these security practices was much higher than we were expecting. That is, teams seem to be practicing these more than, at least if you ask some of our subject matter experts, more than we were our priors suggested, which is a good thing. And which makes it even more of a good thing, they seem to have a lot of positive downstream effects. That is, teams that practice these security practices, <laughs> that implement these security practices, that establish these security practices, tend to have better IT performance, so I mean, software delivery performance and operational performance, but they also tend to have better, if you look at a, maybe the most downstream outcome, just better organiz organizational performance as a whole, which sort of gets to the next theme, drivers of organizational performance. The, the, the report we, we do focuses on a, a variety of outcomes, and we're always trying to understand pretty much what leads and, or what prevents you from getting to these outcomes and what helps you get to these outcomes is maybe an easy way I think about it. Um, but one, one of the key outcomes is organizational performance, which is pretty much a composite of how well is your, your organization doing? And it's using items like customer satisfaction, business goals, um, along with just more broad level attitudinal questions about overall, how did you, how did your organization perform? These get grouped together into a factor that we call organizational performance that tends to have a lot of great, for lack of a, a less annoying term, psychometric properties. It does a really good job um, holding together. And we are always looking for what helps organizations achieve high levels of organizational performance. It's not as easy as just saying, here's a tool, um, use it um, and your company will be great or follow these three um, technical practices and you're set. It, unfortunately, all that, or fortunately, or maybe unsurprisingly, all of that's nested in the, the broader organizational culture and the team culture. And one of the biggest drivers of organizational performance seems to be the, the culture of that organization. So we have a few ways we think about that. One was we use a scale developed by Westrom that pretty much allows us to see, is this a culture where you're, there's high trust and low blame? Right? And cultures, uh, high trust and low blame cultures tend to have very high organizational performance relative. Similarly, organizations with teams that are supported, this, this support could be fin financially, but it could also be through initiatives sponsored by leadership. They tend to have much higher organizational performance. And while this might not be surprising, but if team stability, if, there, if, the, if a team ha doesn't have a lot of churn, if it's able to maintain the same for lack of a better roster throughout the, throughout the year or two, those teams tend to perform better. And those teams tend to also be in organizations that have higher performance. We see that companies that offer flexible work, or work arrangements are tend to be the companies that have the higher levels of organizational performance. Something else that we looked into this year as a driver was reliability. That there's a few ways we understand reliability. One is just we ask people if they're meeting their reliability expectations for their software. But another thing we do is we try to understand their reliability practices. And for that is, is do they even set reliability targets? Do people have access to their reliability targets? And do, is this a common discussion among the team? Like, are people talking, are they aware? Are these, are these targets salient to people? This year was the first year we really did a deep dive into reliability and we kept finding how central it is to getting to organizational performance. So products that are able to create reliable experiences for their customers tend to be the products that lead to higher organizational performance. And the last, there, there's a whole bunch of factors, but one of the last sort of main groupings of factors is cloud. Um, we noticed that a lot people that were adopting cloud and actually particularly multi-cloud were more likely to have higher organizational performance. The last theme, and this was something that I was really excited to, to take on this year in the analysis was, everybody was always talking about how these effects are, they seem pretty robust, but once in a while on certain teams, we notice that they don't, it doesn't work out exactly as our models pan out. And we were wondering, what are the certain contexts in which these effects are more pronounced? What are What's the, what's the environment? What are the situations where we'll see 
these effects have a huge impact and where are the environments where we'll see that they don't have that much of an impact or the environments where they even have a negative impact. So to, to give an example of how we were looking at a, into all these dependencies and these, these if thens, then that's um, software delivery performance, right? So you, you, the IT performance of a team, it has tended to always shown a really strong impact on organizational performance. But this year we noticed that it was a little weaker than, than expected than previous reports. And we had a hunch that it had to do with reliability. So we found that teams that have really high reliability or operational performance tended be, to be the teams that got a lot of benefit out of having good software delivery performance. But if you have good software delivery performance and that reliability isn't there, it's not going to translate into higher operational performance, which is just one example. There are, there's definitely a few more examples around about pretty much how an effect depends on the level of another variable, which is, I think it's it's really exciting because it's it's really it's sitting with a, a philosophy the teams had for a long time. Maybe to to kick off the discussion, we can we'll, we'll dive into security, which, as I mentioned earlier, was a really you know is at the crux of the report this year. For security, we looked at we looked at two different frameworks. We have the supply chain levels for software artifacts, which is something that I, I forget very often when I'm looking, we usually just say salsa. That is one framework we looked into this year. We also looked into um, NISTs, the National Institute of Standard and Technology. There's gonna be more acronyms to come, I'm sure. Um, they also have the secure software development framework. And we looked into these two frameworks as security practices. Um, that we were interested in seeing. The graph that you see on the right is our breakdown of salsa security practices. And as you can see, if you look at the completely or very established, we, we pretty much asked on a scale how established these practices were. You can see that it's many of them are above the 50%. Many of them, majority of the respondents say they've established to some extent. And again, this was sort of surprising to us. If we look at the two, the most established uh, security practice, we see that we have continuous integration and continuous delivery systems for production releases. This was the most established practice with about 63% of respondents saying this was completely or very established. And we could see maybe on the lower end, we have the least commonly established practices, which is two or more reviewers to approve each code change. That's around 45%. And signing build metadata to prevent and detect tampering. So those were on the lower side of adoption, but we're still approaching the, you know, the almost majority, almost majority of respondents saying that they, they use it. Prevalence aside, do these security practices have any impact? For one, we noticed that people who are using these security practices and they're integrated into their software development process are 1.6 times more likely to meet or exceed their organizational goals. And as for what enables or what drives these security practices, as we've seen in early reports, documentation seems to matter a lot for technical capabilities. And what we see here is, is really not too different is that we see the documentation Teams that have good documentation are 3.8 times more likely to implement these security practices. There's an idea of the prevalence, um, what these enable and what enables these security practices. And I know Eddie has a lot to say about this. So I'll pass it over to Eddie. Just to echo a lot of the things that, that you said, right? On the current state and, and the number of breaches that, that are reported. Uh, around malicious attacks, and I've uh, seen organizations that have these cloud configurations, either hybrid or multi-cloud, but misconfigurations or misalignments. Some of the things that you mentioned are really uh, interesting, right? Because we see that a lot of this idea of CICD security practices, and as well as documentation. You know, when, when we look at the practices uh, around security, we not only have the automated part of it, which is th things like uh, source code repository scanning for credentials, 
or uh, interactive application security testing or performance testing uh, and monitoring, as well as things for SaaS applications like looking at third-party component scanning, right? And secrets management. There is also this part of process that continues to be very important. And I think that process and culture is are kind of aligned in many ways, right? You change your culture by changing what you do or changing the way that that you think. So I think that, you know, process allows you not only to have standards and documentation, but it also allows you to inject the right controls across your application lifecycle management, right? Like how do you manage your overall testing, your, your artifact repository, your quality management? How do you do your build management, your source control? And things of that nature. And in, in a way, it's thinking more process first rather than technology first. So, for example, on the security capabilities, when we see them at large, right, we look at like static application security testing, right, which is to analyze application source code and binaries and things like that, right? I think understanding that uh, and the reason and have the processes around it, and the same with things like interactive application security testing or infrastructure vulnerability scanning, or this idea of continuous third-party component scanning, I think looking at reducing the surface uh, of attack, uh, reducing the amount of vectors that you can that you can get attacked with, that is key. And uh, and then you can start looking at uh, at tools, right? I think that in in a way, a lot more organizations are relying on on ways to automate uh, or self self check, um, and that may be. You know, one of the reasons why people are reducing the amount of uh, reviewers uh, of code. And I find also surprising this idea that, you know, looking for code tempering kind of vulnerabilities is uh, lowering even more so because we're moving more towards uh, everything as a service kind of uh, architecture. So those are things that uh, I wanted to add to some of the findings that, that, that you share. There's definitely some other aspects of the report that I think warrant some discussion. And I don't know if, if anyone's familiar with the report, but every year we pretty much do a cluster analysis on what we call our four keys of software delivery performance. So the four keys are how often teams deploy, lead time. So you can sort of think of those two combined as like throughput. And then we also have time to restore services and change fail rate. So we take those four keys, those four dimensions, and run a cluster analysis on them every year. And pretty much all the cluster analysis is trying to do is find centers of gravity in the, across those four dimensions or common segments of responses. And then once we go through the cluster analysis and we look at the distributions of the data, we're, we kind of try to figure out what, are, what is this? So let's say there's four clusters that emerge. What is this segment? What, what's going on with this segment of users? And traditionally, or at least since 2018, we found four clusters and they broke down into pretty nicely into low, medium, high, and elite. This year we ran the analysis and it came back with three clusters. And I was, I was new to the report this year. So I didn't think anything of it. I was just, I brought it back to the team. I said, yeah, three clusters emerged. Um, it's not looking like we have an elite cluster this year. High is close to elite. It's, it's a little higher than last year's high, but it's not elite. And there was a lot, there was more surprise than I expected just because I wasn't familiar with it. Um, I felt as if I broke something and everybody <laughs> was confused because we had traditionally for the last few years did it. So I reran the analysis time and time again, did different clustering approaches, different, uh, statistical techniques to evaluate the clusters and three would fall out. And then after looking at these distributions over and over again, it was pretty clear that there was no elite cluster emerging. So this year we found a low, medium and high. Well, I, I, we only have hypotheses. It's sort of, the answer sort of lies outside of our, the data that we have currently, but we felt it was important to, instead of pushing the data to, to align with what we believed to follow the data and just say, you know what, no matter, no matter how we look at it, how we slice it, this is, this seems to be the way to describe the data we have this year. But it is worth noting that 
if we look at the high cluster versus the low cluster, we'll notice that they're way more likely to adopt and also establish certain technical capabilities, right? So the high cluster relative to the low cluster is 33% more likely to use version control, 39% more likely to practice continuous integration, 46% more likely to practice continuous delivery, and 40% more likely to have systems based on a loosely coupled architecture. I guess that would be a plug for these technical capabilities and their importance in differentiating a high cluster from a low cluster, high performers versus low performers. Another thing that I, I wanted to just bring up before I pass this discussion along, and we, we mentioned this a little bit in the, the executive summary, but I just wanted to really just reiterate on the importance of cloud not only in organizational performance, but, and this might, this might be way downstream, this isn't like an immediately direct effect, but cloud users reported a 16% increase in positive cultural elements, such as less burnout, higher job satisfaction. They also tended to feel more supported in their roles. That is having the tools that they need to do their job, having the, the initiative to sort of steer the direction of their product and their feature set. All of these downstream effects of just simply being a cloud user. And another thing that I think was really, that I really wanna talk more about is how flexible work models are associated with decreased employee burnout and increases in an employee's likelihood of recommending their team. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a finding that deserves some discussion, especially because I don't know, maybe it's because I, I work from home and I was, I'm, I, was, uh, I was definitely on the, I hope we get to work from home side of the debate um, after this is over. In this, we at least found that flexible work models were associated with some positive outcomes. So with that, I'm 99.9% .9 positive. I can pass it over to Manoj. Thank you, Derek. Uh, uh, you know, there is uh, something interesting before I go into the org and team culture, I wanted to, I was also surprised by that cluster analysis, you know, which gave basically no elite and mostly most of the people are in the middle segment. And uh, I was trying to think about it. You know, I, I have a hypothesis. I don't have a data to back it up, but, you know, I do believe that organizations, they have raised the bar for uh, performance in, 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 in DevOps. And uh, they look at it, you know, in order to be elite performer, you just not, it should not be just about putting code into production, right, which people used to do, but it's also about the quality of code, quality of secure code, uh, and whether it's delivering on business outcomes or not. So all those are factors which internally within organizations I have seen that there is a increased visibility of, you know, hey, we, we feel we are good. Does it really mean we are really great, right? So there's a lot of initiatives around that. So that could be a factor. Turning to this topic, you know, this topic is very close to my heart. You know, I do, I work with many clients with agile and product top model transformations and all. And time and again, it has come back that of the two major topics, which is always a barrier, but it's also a, a accelerator for driving the, the performance is, you know, organization and team culture is number one in that always. It always comes up number one. And I have seen that high performing teams or high performing organizations, they have a couple of characteristics, you know, and you talk about that, you know, the report kind of covers them, but I just to summarize, right, the four characteristics that I have seen is number one is the leadership support, right? The visibility of the leaders in front of the teams, supporting the direction, supporting uh, them is extremely important. You know, that drives culture. Second one, and you talked about it a little bit about team persistency. If teams are stable, if teams are, have been working together for some amount of time, that drives a significant amount of performance of the teams, but also raises the performance bar for other teams, which then drives the overall organizational performance. The third one is really, I have seen that high performing teams, they are very proud of their teams. They, they have a mentality of continuous improvement. They are never satisfied. And they are always thinking about how do I continuously improve? They are very proud in sharing their achievements or sharing their 
uh, findings out to others in other teams and others in the organization. And then the last one I said, you talked about it, right? The flexible work arrangements. Uh, like you, I was in on the side that, hey, work from home is great. And I continue to believe that. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you have seen different sides of the article. Something that we have realized in Deloitte and something that we are trying to practice more and more so is together in moments that matter, right? So, you know, you have to figure out what are the moments that matter in culture building? What are the moments that is important in working with your stakeholders, in working with your teams and have those moments and make sure you are together in them. Rest of the stuff that can happen, give people all the flexibility and, you know, they will be motivated, they will be driving work. So it's going to be very important. By the way, one interesting point, you see some everyday equations over here listed. This is something that our CEO does. He publishes everyday equations for us. And we try to do that based on the report and all just you know, take a look at it. Like, I love it, right? Work from home doesn't mean there is a dilution of culture, for example, right? We want to understand that you, know, you could build culture while you're working from home, right? Flexibility is better than routine, you know, where you go eight to nine to five or eight to five at a place and just do the work. So we have just uh, built some things for people to just think about. And with that, I will take it back to you, Derek, to talk about the next topic. Another thing we... We touched on in the executive summary was the the central role reliability plays. Reliability, we often think of it as SREs and things along those lines. But reliability, we broke down into two different facets. We have the practices that we think are important to creating a reliable product, creating high operational performance. And then we have simply does your team feel as if it's hitting its reliability outcomes, SLOs, for example? When we look at this operational performance, it sort of turns out to be like a gatekeeper in some way or another. So software delivery performance, which is those four keys we talked about before, tends to have a really, in previous reports, has shown a really strong impact on organizational performance. But that only seems to happen when operational performance is high. If operational performance is low, it doesn't really matter what the level of software delivery performance is. It's just an, an, an interesting combination. It's sort of a suggestion of you can't, if you just focus on software delivery performance, these four keys that you see on the left, you, it's not gonna be enough to have a stronger impact on organizational performance. So I really like these, these everyday equations. So it'd almost be like software delivery performance times operational performance equals organizational performance is one way you could look at it for this. With, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to, to Eddie to sort of see some of your thoughts about this. I agree with you, and I may revise your formula here in a sec, but I think that you're pretty close in my opinion. We definitely see a lot of benefits, uh, like the ones that we list here and uh, proactive monitoring and response. Uh, and I will even call it instead of more monitoring and response, I will call it more an observability kind of a mindset, right? And I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. Also encouraging this idea of automation over rework. So everything as code, right? And I, I think that everything that we do within this DevOps world either fits three things, right? Either we enable flow, we enable feedback, or we enable innovation, right? And I think like shifting left is a way to enabling flow and enabling feedback, uh, which is this direct correlation with, you know, finding flaws early before the release or, you know, having better communication and having a multi multifaceted kind of focus. But I wanted to also address some of the things that, that you said, right? Because the way that, that I see more the reliability as, um, as a driver to organizational performance is really a combination of, uh, of other things. You have, uh, and it's not only reliability, I will call it also resiliency, right? And, you know, I think it is a combination of architecture and governance by, you know, figuring out how to better define and track and enforce really your architecture patterns and reliability principles and actually fostering an environment of resiliency first culture, right? Because to your point, people feel more comfortable when they feel that they're in a resilient, reliable place. There is also this idea of uh, SRE enablement, which you also briefly talk about, which is applying reliability engineering to things like SDLC, 
and operations with increased automation of capabilities. This idea of observability, just going back to that, uh, is also a component of that reliability and resiliency, right? But it's instead of looking at your logs, your trace, and your metrics separately, you start looking at it more on a unified telemetry kind of framework. And then you're able to build these instrumentation capabilities around your systems and applications so that you, you have full visibility of really what's going on and that you can then be proactive on identifying potential issues before they get into production. And lastly, I think it's also part of uh, chaos engineering, right? Even part of chaos engineering where you can focus on hardening applications and components and have an always on enterprise kind of architecture. And then further, I will uh, decompose this uh, re resiliency even in really three parts. Um, you have the reliability component, which you talk about, which is really about systems availability and design as well as reliability and testing. And then you have the performance efficiency, which is talking about how do you enable infrastructure as well as a way that you auto scale, as well as the performance testing and engineering, which chaos engineering fits a little bit into that. And lastly, I think you hit the nail there with operational performance. And, and I, I, I call it more operational excellence, but you're absolutely right. Uh, and those to us is really divided in five elements, which is uh, dependency management, right? How do you manage the call chains and CIs that make up your production environment for all services, for example? Monitoring and observability, once again. Uh, incident management, release management, and change management. And I think a lot of those is a matter of uh, uh, three parts, right? Uh, culture, process, and technology. Uh, which is not uh, surprising. So I think I will only revise your formula to say that resiliency is a combination of this operational excellence, performance, efficiency, and reliability. And the combination of resiliency and with the elements of reliability is what can provide operational performance. We should measure some of those next year. I, th I, could, I can imagine a, a whole new factor called resiliency um, for, for next year. I think another important topic to to sort of bubble up from the report to talk about is cloud seems to have a lot of really positive downstream effects. A lot of it's mediated by things like the technical capabilities it provides, even some of the cultural benefits it provides. Though so before I make too much of, of a big deal about these, these changes is the survey that we do to pretty much get us the data for the report changes a lot year after year. It changes because we want to be topical, right? We have to add new, new elements to it like security. And then to be nice to the survey respondents, we can't make the survey 45 minutes long. Because the survey is changing year after year, sometimes we, it's harder to make like longitudinal claims and differences from year to year. And also the way we recruit is it's pretty organic. We have to do a lot of work afterwards to get it to line up with the industry. So that's all to say simply that the survey is not 100% designed to look at changes. That said, it's hard not to look at changes. Um, so this year, we noticed that hybrid cloud relative to 2021 increased by 25%. So about 42% of respondents indicated using hybrid cloud. About 76% of respondents, a 36% increase from last year, indicated using public or multiple public clouds. 32% of respondents indicated using private cloud. It's about 12% increase from last year. And maybe what's most interesting and not surprising given the top three rows is only about 10% of respondents indicated using no cloud. That's a 50% decrease from last year. And then we decided, well, we should look into what are the benefits that people who are using multi-cloud? What are the benefits that they're realizing? So we, we used a pretty standard set of benefits that, that in, the, in the industry. And we found out that only 4% of respondents indicated that there were other <laughs> benefits besides these. So these do a pretty good job of encompassing the benefits that people realize adopting their multiple cloud providers. And maybe it's worth noting the top one is availability. So I think it's, it's interesting to take a look at just why people might be using multi-cloud. And these reasons seem to be pretty high up on the list. With that, I'll uh, pass it over to Manoj for, for comment.
Cloud adoption, of course, is increasing significantly, as the report says, and we all know that. Also, we know that significant amount of investment is being earmarked by companies for cloud migrations. Interestingly, I did see a report recently which basically said that almost 80 plus percent of executives have recently, you know, in a, in a survey said that we need to clamp down the cost of cloud. It's increasing significantly and how do we really manage it? So expect to see much more controls over cloud and cloud spending and all of that to be scrutinized much more. I mean, you know, that's what I would say for sure. But having said that, right, I think, you know, there is no doubt in my mind that cloud is related to organizational performance and software del delivery performance. The report says that if you're using cloud, you are perhaps 14 to 15% more likely to exceed all performance goals. It's, the number is perhaps even more, I think, you know, I would say, right? Some of the things that I found very interesting, number one was that new cloud-born companies, right? Companies which are born in cloud and their architecture is all, all cloud, they seem to do better in organizational performance. Perhaps it's a known, it's a, you can build it into an equation, but I think you know th th this was very interesting for me. While companies which have legacy architecture perhaps struggle a little bit uh, uh, more, right? Similarly, performance is more for even companies who are using cloud, but if they are on-prem, that performance is lower compared to companies which are using the public cloud or the hybrid cloud, something like that. I believe it's most likely you know, simply because of the different tools and everything that cloud makes you enable. That's why the public clouds, they perform, people perform better in terms of all the other things, simply because they have much more proliferation of available tools that you could use in order to make yourself better, right? And then the last thing that I noticed is that, you know, how the impact cloud has on all the other factors that impact your software organization, right? So whether it's CI, CD adoption, security, or, you know, just automated code deployments, all of those other factors which are important for software engineering, they are impacted by cloud. And that's a very, very interesting finding. So I know that that's the, I think this was the last theme that we had in terms of uh, topics to discuss. Josh, uh, should I hand it over to you to kind of maybe take some questions? Final call uh, for submitting your questions now, uh, and we will we'll get started with the Q&A now. We had a question early on about uh, kind of the, the correlation between public cloud and security. And so are organizations that have public cloud deployments in a better security position? Um, is there a correlation there or is site reliability an independent characteristic of cloud adoption? I think that those are two different uh, things. I think that on one end, the uh, the implementation of site reliability uh, practices, observability practices, things like uh, architecture and governance, all these things that we mentioned in a, in a very direct manner impacts your security posture, right? Now, your selection of uh, hyperscaler or selection of architecture, whether it's on-prem, single cloud or multi-cloud, you know, can be done with security in mind, which will also impact your security posture. And both together will give you what is your ultimate security posture, right? That's my, that's my take. I was actually just looking at <laughs> the data that we, we have about public cloud and how it impacts reliability and how it impacts security practices. I, I think it's, it's very clear that they are definitely independent. I would agree with that hundred percent. I think it's worth noting that if you look at the people, who, the data of people who use public cloud tend to have higher reliability outcomes based on pretty much a single item the question is just whether or not they meet their expectations and they tend to be the respondents who have who work on teams that have established these security practices as well it could be a third variable right like behind this there's just sort of a engineering excellence or something like that that you know pushes them to adopt the cloud and pushes them to adopt security practices and pushes that team to be more reliable right or it could be that there's some inherent benefits to some of these public cloud providers that allows teams to uh, more easily implement these security practices or it could just be a characteristic of the teams that that adopt all of these. We are seeing, um, just to reiterate, that public cloud does seem to have a positive impact on security practices and on reliability. Let's turn it to the next question. 
Um, so how does adoption of DevOps practices impact key business metrics? The specific ones that this individual is interested in are you know, ROI, revenue, net promoter score. Uh, was there any thought, Derek, as you did the report on the impact on metrics? Definitely. So we looked into um, technical capabilities that are often asso associated with DevOps practices and how those impact organizational performance. It's a composite of a lot of these, not all of these, but many of these outcomes that you're mentioning, revenue, ROI, and MPS. So it's a, it's a composite of customer satisfaction. It's a composite of whether or not your organization was able to meet its business goals. Top of mind, what's interesting about the relationship between these is, is that there is a direct relationship, a positive one, but it seems to be mediated through two factors. One was reliability. These technical practices tend to lead to higher reliability. And these technical practices, or maybe DevOps practices, tend to also increase security practices, which then leads to higher organizational performance. So I guess the, sh the short answer without talking about mediation is yes. I would add, uh, you, know, you know, and it's always difficult to, you know, connect the, techno the technical advancements to organizational performance. I have seen this in practice at some of the clients that we work with, for example, with the advanced DevOps, CI, CD pipeline and all other practices around DevOps. One of the clients, for example, of mine was able to roll out a new product that they thought about, right? in 12 weeks uh, out to the market, right? Basically that product got them around $7 million, uh, you know, additional revenue stream through the practice, right? So we do see impact created through these, you know, uh, and many such examples, although I don't know if we are still there to tie it to that matrix and show uh, proof that, you know, that that's what happens really. But but there are several such examples that, you know, it does result in that. Uh, next question is the cost of cloud is increasing. Are there any identified DevOps tools and practices that would help to continuously optimize the costs? I think that that is a really interesting question because, um, and, and in a way it's also a little bit tied to like this idea of uh, multi-cloud. When you start looking at, you know, for example, the Intels of the world. There is also a battle of having squeezing more out of that lemon, so to speak, because they are looking at, okay, how much compute can I really bring out of a, a specific process? And even using things on top like um, Red Hat, for example, you can put out Red Hat OCM, and then you have an on-prem um, you know, instance, and then you have a cloud instance. And a Monte Carlo application, Monte Carlo simulation application on top. And then we were able to look at processing the same thing on two different CPUs uh, and the gains that translates into costs. And, and I think that um, hyperscalers are looking at this across the board on how they can offer faster, better, cheaper microprocessors for you know, computing, which in terms lowers the cost of that cloud. For sake of time, we have to cut it off there. I'll quickly turn it over to Monoj to talk a little bit more about our Agile DevOps practice, and then we will uh, wrap up. You know, this slide, just a flash of uh, our Agile DevOps modern delivery practice for Deloitte. I won't spend too much time over here. And uh, uh, you know, let's go to the next one, um, maybe. So, you know, uh, Derek, me, Eddie, Joss, all of us, uh, you know, are very happy that all of you could join and really appreciate the time you have spent with us together. Would love to continue the conversation outside of this forum. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Happy to connect in, in an offline manner or any way you would feel that we can help. Not just answering this question that is left, but even other questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um,